Great. So, um, yeah, thanks, James, for that, that introduction. So um, I'm actually going to start out with a little bit of interactive, though. Um, so I want to ask you all a question. So how have you or anyone you known ever been burdened by technology in any way? Can you think of examples of a time that you were just annoyed by something or, yeah, James? My battery died early this morning when I was walking the dog and uh, somehow I'm addicted to listening to uh, <laughs> NPR when I should just be relaxing and walking yep. the dog. Okay, so technical failures. What else? A few weeks ago, the fire alarm went off in my dorm, and I was woken up at 3 a.m. Okay, yep, so annoyance or um, disturbing your sleep, yep, okay. What else, yeah, Ellie? My activity tracker keeps reminding me that I'm not walking enough. Yeah, that makes you feel guilty, yep, yep, yep. Uh, whatever my computer does, I have to sit in a seat like this, so I'm close to a uh, charger. Okay, so kind of constraining you physically, yep, okay. Anything else? Yep. Spam. Spam, yep, so annoying, yep. Too, yeah. Like, oh, in terms of like notifications and things like that, or okay, just cool. junk, phone calls, junk phone calls. Mails. Yeah, so I was going to say the guilt of being overwhelmed by all this kind of email that I know I can't. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of the, the, the you can never keep on top of things. Yep. Anything else people want to share? All right, so you guys did a pretty good job covering. So we did a bunch of interviews, and we got a lot of uh, feedback from people about the ways that the technology burdens them as well. Um, we talked to them about specifically what technologies in particular. Um, so we had them talk about one technology that they were currently using and talk about the ways that it burdens them, and then one technology that they had actually stopped using for whatever reason. Um, and so this isn't all of them, but some of the themes that the themes had come up was that basically they're just not getting enough value for the amount of effort they have to put into it. Um, it's too expensive to keep up. Like people talked about, like, oh, I just stopped using the iPad because it broke and it cost six hundred dollars to replace, and I just didn't have the money to use it to, to replace it. Um, they would forget about it, or they were tired of thinking about it. A lot of times, fitness trackers came up in this category of like, gosh, you know, like I forgot it today, and then I stopped forgetting it, and then I just stopped thinking about it. Um, some people had quit using things about concerns about privacy. Um, they were worried about becoming addicted to it or its impact of, of using it in a family setting or you know, things like phones at the dinner table while at a restaurant, so they're worried about the impact there. Um, or just they, they bought something thinking it was cool and they just couldn't figure out how to use it and they, they trashed it. So um, those were some of the, the, the things that we had come up with. So um, throughout um, kind of this big exploration of, of the ways that, that burdens might place, um, be placed on people while they use technology, we ended up developing um, a model for this. And so the model of user burden that we've worked on um, consists of six different constructs. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we came up with those particular constructs. But um, the kind of six overall categories that, that we came up with were um, difficulty of use. So that includes things like you couldn't figure it out, or it was difficult to learn, or also things like I needed help with this. So you know, think about the, the person who's new to technology, and they were constantly having to like beg their, their um, nephew to come configure it for them. Um, so they just need to help from people. Um, but also people with a disability who couldn't use, like, a, um, if they were visually impaired and they, they needed to always grab a sighted person to help them configure it. Um, we heard about, like, game systems and, like, you know, um, video game systems that always required a sighted person to turn on in the first place because it was really difficult um, to find the, the actual button on it. Um, then we had physical burdens, um, and that was, you know, a lot of things around uh, you know, the, the physicality, constraining people to spaces, wearing things, those sorts of things. Um, time and social burdens, which is pressures on, you know, taking up too much of my time as well as disrupting my, my social um, connections as well. So distracting me from family, distracting me from friends. Um, mental and emotional burdens. I'm going to go in, in more detail on each of these, but um, mental and emotional burdens were things like, you know, having to remember to use it or things making you feel guilty, for example. Um, privacy burdens, so worried about information being shared or, or what, not knowing what's being collected about them, and then financial burdens, so it just is too expensive to buy or maintain. Um, so within our model, we made a definition um, of each of these. So for difficulty of use, you know, the system does not fit within the abilities of user or is difficult to use. So um, some of the examples that came up in, in our discussions wasn't actually the, the, the bendy fork that's impossible to use, but I like that, that particular one. Um, but things like um, you know, uh, fitness or sorry, health-based trackers that were inaccessible to people with visual impairments. Um, you know, they couldn't use uh, their blood glucose meter. They were they were blind because they were diabetic, and they actually couldn't use the the blood glucose meter because it they couldn't read the display. Um, 
um, or things with a steep learning curve. So people mentioned things like Photoshop, right? It's like, oh yeah, I heard Photoshop is the greatest thing to do. I'm, I like photography, but they open it up and they're completely overwhelmed and they, they can't figure it out. So things with steep learning curves fit in this category. Um, the second one was physical burdens. So the system makes the user physically uncomfortable in, in some way. So um, that could be um, physically painful. So maybe you guys heard about the version of Fitbit that was actually like causing rashes on people's hands. Um, but also things like um, that are uncomfortable or heavy. This is actually one of the original wearable computers. And it was really funny because they could never get women to wear these because they were actually so heavy. Um, and it was, it was they were really bulky and heavy. So couldn't be in that way as well. But then the physical constraints as well, like having to sit next to the wall uh, because your cord is there, physically constrains you in, in some way. Um, or exercise technologies that would you know, be you know, bothersome while you're running. A lot of times runners didn't want to have anything on their bodies while they're running. Um, time and social burden, so and, and when we were building the model, these ended up converging uh, when we did our analysis, but um, this was that the system might require a significant amount of time to use or disrupts the user's ability to create and sustain social relationships. Um, so the big examples that came up there were things like, um, you know, obviously phones came up a lot, you know, people were annoyed of going out to restaurants with people who had sat there on their phone the whole time. Um, that definitely came up a lot. Um, but then also things like um, just having to remember to use it so frequently, so your phone's getting notifications all the time, or like food journals that require you to like go in, you know, like 80 times a day, and you know, and that I had a little bite of you know, M&M that I grabbed from there and had to go in and enter it there. So just having to be using it frequently throughout the day. Um, but then also things that annoy others. So you know, we talked about people that were spamming, you know, your your news feed of like I went out for a run for for three miles. Well, there's some good research by uh, uh, James Fogarty students about what actually makes that interesting. But they, were, they felt bad if it was kind of spamming their friends um, or with, with kind of uninteresting posts. But um, those were some of the things that came up in that category. Uh, mental and emotional burdens. Oh, my animation right there. But this uh, requires the system to a uh, significant amount of attention or concentration. It could be distracting, makes the user feel bad, or makes them unnecessarily worry. Um, so, I don't know where that one came from, but um, <laughs> that was a stray image in there. Um, but you know, for the example, um, Wii Fit, you know, if, you, if you were familiar with this game from Nintendo, you actually had a little platform and you stepped on it and it would weigh you, and it would actually make your Wii Fit character expand and tell you, that's obese. And it's like really kind of nasally voice, which is super annoying. And um, they actually had like videos of like, you know, teenagers or like really young kids being told they're obese and like crying. And, so it wasn't really a, a, a fun thing. So it really made you feel bad about yourself. Uh, makes you worry unnecessarily. So this is actually a personal example of mine. I don't know if anyone has used the Delta app before for flights, but um, I was flying, I think I was on a flight from Seattle to Atlanta, and it was like a five hour flight, and I pop open my phone, I wanna look up where my next gate is, and I get this big red warning saying like, my flight is delayed, and the first option I see is find alternative flights. And I was like, oh no, crap, I'm gonna be late. Turns out my flight was one minute late. Uh, it had arrived, it was like supposed to arrive at 7.04, and I got it at 7.05, but it triggered this uh, big red warning, uh, so it made me kind of worry unnecessarily. Um, and then things like requires concentration, so like really complex visualizations or things like that. Yeah, James. So what a similar problem to that would be one where the warning um, doesn't make, necessarily make you worry, but it makes you do extra work. Sure, yeah. Thinking if you will, like yeah. um, Google Maps would show you, maybe hey, a shorter route, <laughs> yeah. and it's like one minute, yeah. which maybe is worth it when it's a four minute trip, but like you're on a, you know, an hour drive or something. It saves like, one minute, yeah. Why are you telling me this? Yeah, so unnecessarily distracting people would probably fit into that. That would fit into that category as well. So if it's kind of distracting unnecessarily, that would come in there as well too. Um, yeah, anything that requires kind of significant amounts of concentration as well fell into this category. Um, privacy burdens, I kind of talked about a little bit, but the definition was the system risks, risks revealing information about a user that he or she would prefer not to share. Um, so people talked about things like confusing privacy settings, like maybe they had the ability to go in and do these things, but it was such a burden to kind of go in and do that and pay attention to it, and the default settings were bad, and they had to, or they kept changing. Facebook is notorious for this, um, so that came up a lot. Um, as well as things like, you know, capturing data or sharing without transparency. So I think people talked about things like, oh, I installed this app and I signed in with Facebook and before I knew it, all my friends got this like spammy invite um, and I didn't realize that I'd given permission to, to access my friends list. Um, so those sorts of things. Or things like, you know, people had wearable cameras and things that are capturing things without people knowing and not knowing how to notify them. And so people were, um, people also mentioned things like drones as well. So if you have, uh, like I'm worried about my neighbor's drone and you know, they capture, you know, taking pictures of me inside my window. 
Um, but um, the last category was financial burden. So this one's pretty straightforward, but basically costs a lot of money um, for the user to initially purchase or maintain use. Um, and this is obviously relative to the person. So you a, a, a lower income person, you know, having to spend $200 on a, a phone is way outside of there, whereas $200 for someone who's more well off, that may not be a burden to them. So this one is definitely relative based on the person. But you know, things came up where you know, things that cost too much initially, uh, MacBooks came up uh, on that one as well. But you know, Google Glasses, obviously, when that came out, people were like, there's no way I'm spending that much money on that. Um, and then um, things like, you know, expensive to maintain. If I break it or lose it, I can't afford to replace it. Um, also things like um, subscription fees came up too. So if you had to kind of keep paying over time, then that was an undue burden for people. Um, so we ended up developing this um, through uh, the development of a validated measure called the User Burden Scale. Um, we'll be presenting this at CHI um, next month, actually. Um, but basically what we've done is we've done a bunch of interviews and created a, a whole set of burdens and we developed questions based on that. Um, and the questions when we did our, our um, validity ended up grouping into these, these six categories that I just described. Um, but the scale itself, um, we, we basically were designing all these technologies and not really in saying that we were trying to reduce the burden but had no way of actually um, saying, proving that we had reduced the burden. So this was our, our way of, of, of figuring out how to do that. Um, so um, ended up being a 20-item scale with six subscales in each of the six categories. Um, and it's designed for both systems that people are currently using as well as systems that have been abandoned. So we have two versions of the scale based on the technology. Um, so the example questions are, you know, using, you, you would actually pipe in the name of the, the technology, so Facebook or Fitbit or anything along those lines. Um, you'd pipe the thing in. So using Facebook made me feel like a bad person, um, was a mental and emotional one. Um, I use um, uh, Netflix more often than I should, um, and then they can kind of say never a little bit sometimes. We had two different types of questions there. So you can kind of get a sense of that, you know, the system's policies about privacy are not trustworthy. Um, I need assistance from another person to use that. So that's how they fit into each of those categories. Yes, James? How do you validate? I'm going to do that right next. <laughs> So uh, we validated with over 1,000 people. Um, they got to opt into saying what technology they wanted to evaluate. Um, and I'll go through some examples of some of the stuff that they put in there. Um, but you know, we tested the, the validity of the um, components using principal components analysis. We did inter item re reliability. Um, we did concurrent validity with technology still in use versus abandoned. And so we were able to show that the scale was sensitive to being showing that you know, technologies that had been abandoned had higher burden in various categories than technologies that were still in use. Um, and then we did convergent validity um, compared to the system usability scale, um, which measures kind of the more positive aspects. So user burden sort of the more negative aspects. And so um, we saw um, basically opposite correlation with, with uh, the SUS um, and conversion with along some of the metrics within the NASA TLX, which, measure, which measures task load, which is another sort of similar one. Um, so the details are all in our, our paper, um, which I can uh, will be at CHI um, next month. But that was basically what we have validated, validated it against. And um, the, ended up with the six subscales. So we have varying numbers of questions within each one. Um, and so the idea is that you, if you didn't care about privacy, uh, some people don't, you don't have to include those questions in the scale. Or if you only really care about physical, you're designing a wearable technology, you want to assess physical, you can only use that. So the scale is valid within each of those scales as well. Um, and within each category, you can get an average score. Um, so you can kind of say like, okay, this one's high in privacy, but low in uh, mental and emotional. Um, so you can kind of see those trade-offs as well within each of the scores. Um, so just for fun, um, here are some of the scores uh, for various technologies that people in our validity study showed us. Um, so you can kind of see the six dimensions around the circle. And um, we had people um, either say that this is a technology that they were using currently or that they had abandoned. So you can kind of compare the different levels of burden. So the using in this case is blue and the abandon is orange. Um, so this is an iPad. Um, so the people who had abandoned it was actually high difficulty in use for them, um, whereas the people who are still using it was actually low. So the, the, the more extreme is the, the higher burden. Um, same thing with uh, the mental and emotional was higher for the people who had abandoned that technology, but lower um, for that. So, um, but time and social seem to be about equal for people in terms of the abandoned versus not. Um, here's PayPal. Uh, so it seems like the people who are abandoning it were abandoning it because of privacy issues as well as difficulty of use issues. Um, and a little bit in some of the others. Um, the numbers of each category, this is the number of people who responded about PayPal. Or um, So there were 18 who were still using it in our set of data and uh, 22 who had abandoned it. 
Um, this is Fitbit. Um, so it's interesting. I was thinking, I, was, I thought that physical would actually be a, more of an issue for people, but it was more of an issue for the people who are still using it than the people who had abandoned it. Um, but the difficulty of use um, and privacy were the biggest concerns for the people. It's a pretty small sample, um, so you can kind of take that so with a grain of salt. Let's say yeah. somebody's issue was, oh, I got to charge it or something. Right. Would that go in a difficulty of use? Or so that would probably. How would I think about that in answering? Right. So I would say that probably being close is like having to remember to do something. So maybe in the mental and emotional. So you know, having to remember to use it was something that came up there. Um, or if it was about the time issue in terms of. You know, I need to take the time to, out of my day to do this, and it might fit more into time. One social so. one was one is that, oh, people will see me wearing this classic thing. Yeah, yeah, or is dorky looking, or um, or like the spamming your friends sort of thing fit into social, or I don't want people to know that I'm using it. Um, I can, if people are interested, I can pull up the full set of questions and kind of get a sense for what's in each category. But the definitions that I talked about kind of are related to the the questions in each. Um, so we have uh, Kindle. Um, so people who are um, it was interesting, the, the time in social, uh, probably more time in this case, was really, really high for Kindle um, for the people who are still using it because it, they're spending a lot of time in it. Um, um, but you know, the people who weren't kind of maybe abandoned it because it wasn't useful. And this kind of highlights one of the issues of using user burden on its own um, as opposed to do, do, doing it in a set of uh, things within kind of competing systems because user burden doesn't tell us anything about value. Um, so, for example, they may actually value reading on a Kindle, so they're willing to have a higher time and social burden. So that's one of the things that we want to evaluate is, is how things compare when they, they value it highly. And we, we suspect that people are much more willing to put up with burden if they get more value out of it. Um, and then we had Gmail. I was actually surprised by a number of people that had abandoned Gmail, <laughs> uh, but they didn't like it because of difficulty of use, um, and everyone was concerned about privacy. But again, if they value it, they may be willing to put up with private, any privacy concerns that they have. Um, but you know, I suppose maybe they had found another email solution that was easier than Gmail for them, and that's why they had abandoned it. Um, Netflix, <laughs> everyone thought it was a waste of time, or at least a time burden in general, um, a time and social. And you know, for the most part, you know, people might have find it more of a financial burden. That was one of the few that was sort of a, a more financially based thing. Um, and for all of these, people are allowed to put enter in whatever technology they wanted. Um, so in our future work, we're going to try and actually specifically look at, at some technologies. What's the number that each of those uh, gray lines represent? Oh, so this is so it's um, zero to four is the scale. So yeah, so this is like a four point five average um, right there. So, so. Even yeah, it's not as bad. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Hey, we're pricing it okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, a lot of people feel like it's valuable for what they pay, I think. So, um, I think, and the questions in the financial category were definitely more about like, this is a good use of my money, or sorry, this is, uh, I don't get enough value out of this for what I'm paying for. So, the questions were around that way. Um, and then lastly, Facebook was their most popular one that people rated. Um, and privacy burden was, was pretty high, especially for the people who felt abandoned um, and the, the time and social were high. But um, financial, obviously, there's no money that you have to pay and uh, the difficulty of use. People who abandoned it found it a little bit more difficult, but yeah. Um, mechanical Turk users in the United States. Um, so so all where they would Yeah, no one actually stuff. put it. We did have a couple people put in Mechanical Turk as their, their so I could probably pull out uh, those. But they were kind of, a, it was a long tail for sure. So these are the, the more popular ones um, in there. but. Yeah, so they were, um, and our, our um, criteria was just people who use technology frequently, and obviously Turkers are using technology so frequently. Did you have all of the, like a long list of these products? Or they yeah, no, it was it was open ended. We did give some, like for example, Facebook or GPS system. We tried to give a, a range of like five or six ones in there. Yeah. Any comparison for the same categories like uh, there is no other social network nowadays, but Netflix and mm -hmm. iTunes Store or Apple TV. Um, probably, yeah. I have to go back through. Like I said, it was a pretty long tail. So these were the top eight that were kind of the most common. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cluster different respondents, like across <coughs> different products, to see. Oh, you know, he. Oh yeah. Just yeah. seems to have privacy problems yeah. across everything. We could, yeah. We haven't done that yet, but we certainly could. And then the next level, the cool and then whatever.
Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah, and so user burden, I think this is sort of a population thing, but yeah, absolutely. My burden may not be the same as James, it may not be the same as, you know, a person with a disability who might be a person, with, like I said, with the financial, it definitely depends on the person in terms of, of their um, financial status. Um, and, and. From the ones you've shown us, uh, is Facebook the only one where people have banned it or using more time and social than people are still using it? I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure. I didn't make that. It could be. But yeah, but maybe because they found it to be a time burden. Yeah. yeah. Even though it was like time burden, uh, people were using it. They still got value, yeah. So this could be almost like it's a time suck, but they don't value it. And that is kind of a small difference, so I'm not sure if that's, we didn't run any statistical significance on these. This is just kind of a visual. Actually, we just put this together this week. This is the first time we looked at this at that level, but yeah. Abandoned mean they they tried it and then stopped using it, or they're not trying it at We let them self-define what abandonment. Um, so we just said, uh, do answer this questionnaire for technology you used to use, but no longer. So we didn't necessarily say, you tried it once and quit. Um, you know, just you used to use And we let people sort of define what they meant by that. But yeah, good question. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. Do yeah. you think you could use this to evaluate whether a company was at risk of losing, oh, a company was at risk of losing customers? Potentially, yeah. We haven't done that yet, but I would imagine um, you know, pe maybe people could regularly do this over time, and if they're starting to see burdens grow over time, then they could kind of get some early warning. Yeah, could be. Yeah, so they could kind of have a, you know, how's, how's Facebook doing today in, in terms of that? I don't Maybe. I uh, haven't run this by them yet, but we'll see. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, and oh, the last one was Skype. But this is actually interesting. You know, the people there's a really big difference between the, the people who are using it, uh, uh, it and it was actually a, a, there was the most abandoned technology in terms of the the using versus abandoned. Uh, the people who'd abandoned it just re found it really difficult to use, and the people who are still using it found it super easy to use. So it could just be you know I don't know if those were all Microsoft workers or you know, people who work for Skype or or whatnot, but yeah, they felt that that was actually the the biggest difference uh, um, for them. Um, so why should we care about reducing user burden? Um, so you know, I talked a little bit about abandonment, um, but you know, I think that you know, the user burden can definitely lead to technology abandonment, especially if it's discretional use. So things like you know, all of us kind of probably complain about things that we have to use for work. You know, like we have to use email probably. Um, we probably have to use Microsoft Word or some other word processing software. But if it's sort of, you know, a game or a social network or things along those lines, then people, you know, can stop using it because of that. Um, I think it can limit the type of people who will be able to benefit from different types of technology. So obviously a financial burden, if it's high, is going to limit the type of people who can afford to use it or people with disabilities and things along those lines. Um, and then just contributing to overall negative user experience. So I kind of talked about the end result of a lot of research. Now I'm going to kind of go back and talk to you a little bit more about how we built up to that. Yeah. So one final question. Yeah. Is there any sort of hindsight bias you saw that is something that people would amplify or would suppress afterwards relative to how they would feel about, about it at the time? Like in general, right. were people more like... You know, they overestimated how much the time burden mattered relative to how they might have actually felt if you we didn't necessarily look at that, but I think that's actually a really great idea to sort of think about um, you know people who just start using a technology versus someone who's using it for many you know months or so because you know, people may you know, I first signed up for Facebook and I was like oh yeah I can check it a couple times a day and it won't be much of a time burden whereas they've been using it for a year and they're like oh my god I'm spending an hour a day on it that's way more than I thought so I, I don't know if we can predict what people will be thinking um, but we can certainly kind of compare out how it changes over time. I'm also particularly interested in you know. 12 months in, mm -hmm. and then say 12 months after I abandoned. Right. Like, am I amplifying how, how strongly I felt about it? Yeah, and I, we didn't ask them how long ago they had abandoned it, so that might be a good thing to, to follow up there. Yeah. Did you uh, value or characterize abandonment, uh, abandonment as something that's either beneficial or negative for people? Because some people might actually feel better by abandoning things, right? Yeah, and that's and actually. Yeah. Less than yeah, so the, the question is kind of did we. Um, control for whether there's a positive or negative abandonment. And there is some interesting work. I think there was some at UBComp last year that was talking about like graduating from technologies. So like you needed a technology as a support, but then you learned enough from it that you didn't need it anymore. So things like fitness tra tracking technologies came up with this. You know, I needed Fitbit to get an understanding of where I was, but now I have a good understanding, so I don't need it anymore, and I've graduated from it. So we didn't, yeah. what's that? Do you think that example actually? I don't 
for, for I don't know. People. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and we didn't. Ca we just said a system that you're using that you no longer use. And so I think a lot of all those things came up because a lot of times people don't use a phone anymore because it's obsolete, um, and that's not necessarily a burden issue. Um, so that could also be um, a reason why they stopped using a technology just because you know uh, they stopped. Like Google Reader stopped. You know, I abandoned it because they stopped making it right, and a lot of people didn't like that. So um, maybe they wanted to keep using it, but they couldn't anymore. So we didn't actually get through the nuance of that. Yeah. Method detail. Mm -hmm. So you sampled, you said, yeah. uh, tell us about something you abandoned. All of those had people who were still using stuff. So where did the using data come from? Um, we had them answer it through one of each. So we said, fill this out for a technology that you currently use, and fill this out for a technology you used to use but no longer use. So that was our, our two that we did. Yeah. Do you think there's a difference in the way we perceive burdens based on whether we think that that technology is good for us or not. So like, if I abandon my fitness tracker, I might actually feel very guilty about yeah. doing it. And so I might amplify the burdens so that <laughs> I can sort of make myself seem like I suspect there's probably some of that going on. <laughs> I don't know that our, our scale can necessarily capture that, but I think that's actually something to consider for sure. Like, maybe mm -hmm. Do you think that it was a good thing that you abandoned? Right, yeah, that's true. Is this a, was this a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, that's a good, good point. Great. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, so um, that was kind of the, the output of, of what we did, but this was actually built up through um, a large number of, of studies um, and technology designs that I've done. So it's probably going to be kind of fire hose like in terms of summarizing a lot of the stuff that uh, my group has done. Um, so kind of going to talk to you a little bit about a number of different studies. And I do put the papers on there, so if you want to learn more or if you want to have follow-up questions, we can, but this will probably be a pretty big overview. Um, so um, the first thing that we had looked at was looking at this emotional burden. So this had come up by working on technology for parents um, and looking at tracking things like, do, does my kid have early warning signs of autism or developmental delay? Um, and a lot of people had talked about how um, you know, they were really scared to get that news through a technology or tracking it made them feel bad or like they were doing something wrong. So this, this idea of, of emotional burden kind of came up through, through talking to people in that context. So um, we ran a study of, um, you know, how we can design interfaces that might convey potentially bad news around health, um, but convey it in a way that minimizes emotional burden was our kind of question. Um, so we had interviewed doctors and patients um, who had experienced diagnosis of a chronic condition um, to talk about things like information needs um, and reviewed medical training recommendations. So how do they train doctors to kind of share this news? So we reviewed a lot of the, the literature from that um, to find out what sort of things help with, with kind of conveying things to minimize emotional burden around these things. Because you, know, you don't want to necessarily hide information from people, but you want to convey it in a way that will cause them to act or um, make them be informed as opposed to avoiding it. Um, so things that we talked about that we learned were um, you know, people wanted, definitely wanted the access to the information, but in a way that's sensitive and emotional to their fears and anxieties. So things like you know, acknowledging that it's normal to feel guilty, you know, people who didn't use their foot, didn't walk. Uh, maybe it's like, it's normal to feel bad that you didn't walk today, just acknowledging that potential um, burden. Um, and then also giving them actionable information is a great thing to do as well. So if you say like, you know, it looks like you didn't meet your step goal today, if you immediately gave them an action right with that news, then it went over much better than sort of giving them no actionable information. So you, if you set a suggestion like, next time, why don't you try you know, leaving the house five minutes early to, to walk to the next bus stop? If you gave them like a specific actionable recommendation, that came over much better for the people. So that was kind of what guided a lot of our thinking and emotional um, burdens. Um, we looked at um, uh, privacy burdens a bit. Um, so this is a study I'd done um, a couple years back with, with folks at Intel Labs when it was still existing. Um, but we were interested in, in how people perceive things like privacy in the home, um, for things like you know, sensing systems. So, um, but it's really hard to ask questions about privacy without knowing specific scenarios in which, or the context in which potential privacy um, breaches would happen. Um, so what we did was we did a, a four-week um, so, oh yeah, so the question was, you know, how do we, um, what, what was their receptiveness to, to um, privacy concerns? Um, we did a four-week cultural probe where we sent them home with a camera, a diary, and what we called um, sensor proxies. Um, so these were essentially just um, uh, light sensors with a motion sensor on it. So light, lights with a motion sensor on it. So you, you walk by and the light turns on. Um, we put a little question mark around that. And we told them to treat that as a sensor um, and pretend that 
when this, you see this light turn on, pretend that that moment was just captured by some sort of sensing system to give them a sense of like, oh gosh, I just walked by that and it turned on and I'm naked, yo. And so you know, they, they wouldn't have necessarily thought of that scenario unless they had been in it. And we had them keep a diary of those sort of incidents that came up. Or the light came on and they had a neighbor over and they didn't, they, the neighbor's like, what is that light there? And so that kind of got them um, thinking about things like notification and whatnot. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of mental effort in trying to remember that these things were uh, recording, sort of social issues that came up with privacy in terms of notification and sharing. Um, and so those are some of the things that had kind of uh, got to our thinking about the privacy burdens. Um, we did a lot of work in the, the sleep space. So we did a, a big qualitative study looking at how we can use technologies for sensing sleep. Um, so we were interested in sort of, um, you know, it was, it was relatively underexplored at the time, so we wanted to, to look at what are the, the opportunities and challenges in this space. Um, so we did literature review, we did a contextual inquiry at the sleep lab um, at the University of Washington, and we did a big survey and interviews um, with potential users of these technologies um, to kind of do this deep um, insight into the sleep space. Um, this is kind of where the, the physical stuff came out. So a lot of people were hesitant to wear things to bed. Um, you know, so at the time, you know, there was lots of wrist-worn things, but there were also like headbands, and you know, people just had this sort of aversion to wearing things on their body. Um, but then also things like remembering to record, so some of the mental burdens that came out of this work was thinking about, um, you know, Fitbit at the time, you had to push a button to start it and stop it, and you know, people said like, oh, when I fall asleep at night, I always forget to do that. Um, so that was just sort of a remembrance thing. Or when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I want to do is crawl out of bed and go get my coffee and get in the shower. I'm not wanting to log anything um, at that point. So, um, and then you know, manual tracking is always harder when you're sleep deprived. <laughs> so people wanted things like super, super easy. They said, don't make me think at all when I'm sleepy or sleep deprived. Um, so this is sort of where some of those other aspects of burdens came out. Um, the, we did a, also work on sort of um, what we called the like extremely successful people uh, in quantifying self, the quantified selfers. So yeah, these are the people who are doing all sorts of technologies and using them to, you know, um, almost an extreme. Um, so we thought it would be really interesting. It's like, okay, if the people who are really successful, if they find things burdensome, then what can we learn about them? Yep. Do you mean successful in that they're successful in using the technologies yeah. or have positive impacts from them? Um, so I'd say that they are successful in sort of accomplishing what many people have difficulty doing, and that's keeping large amounts of data about their behavior. So you know, you know things like in the general population, if you keep a sleep diary for even more than a day, um, you're probably seen as great, whereas quantified selfers are doing things like for years at a time. So kind of looking at that from that, that perspective. Um, so uh, for, yeah, so we want to know about you know, what, what are people learning about the ways that they track technology and how we can be informed by that. And so we did an analysis of um, 52 posts. So the, the Quantified Self community has a blog post where they post 15-minute um, talks of people sharing their experience. And so um, we watched 52 of these videos and coded them for various aspects. And they, they, they talk about that the videos have a very uh, set format where they're asking about what did I do, um, how did I do it, and what did I learn? Um, so that would give us a nice structure for, for analyzing those things. And so, what we learned is that even though these are sort of this, this case of people who are doing this amazing thing, and not only were they able to do it, but they were able to stand up and talk about it for 15 minutes. So that's why we mean by kind of these pretty successful people. Um, and what we learned is that you know people, even quantified selfers, get burned out. Um, so we learned that the, the number one thing that they, they, they even called it, they deemed it the classic newbie mistake, which was trying to track too much at once um, too soon. Uh, and so they would get all excited because they're motivated at first and they'd track everything at once. Um, and then so that was sort of this, and they burned out really quickly. Even the, 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 uh, um, the highly motivated people burned out quickly. Um, they, learned, they learned that not knowing the right things to track. So they'd often track something like they wanted to figure out um, what was causing their headaches. And so they just logged every time they had a headache. But they forgot to log things like the context around the headache. So they had a log of like, okay, I had 20 headaches over the last three months. And they happened more often on Thursdays. But they forgot to track like weather, what did I eat that day, did I have caffeine? So they didn't track any of the useful things that would have been helpful to kind of answer their questions. So yeah, they were annoyed that they had sort of spent all this effort tracking all this stuff, but they didn't actually know what to do with it. And that kind of led it to the, the inconclusive data where they said they had all this data, but they couldn't actually draw the conclusions they wanted from it. Um, and then lastly, this is a, a new thing that we've been looking at. So I've been also looking at you know, burdens of technology within family contexts as well. And so um, this is a paper that uh, we presented at CCW this year that was looking at the rules that family have, families have around um, technology use. Um, and this is kind of getting at the social burdens of this. Um, so 
Our questions were how are families currently setting and keeping rules for both parents and children? So we had parents describe the rules that they have for their child and for themselves, and we had children rate the rules that their parents have assigned them as well as the rules that they wish that their parents followed. Um, so it's kind of getting that kid's perspective also about you know, what should parents be doing. Um, we heard a lot of things like you know, be present, and a lot of kids don't want their, kid, their parents to text and drive either, apparently that came up too. Um, we had a little bit of a media around this as well, and of course the, um, the big rule that was actually kind of a minor part of our study was that parents were being, uh, kids didn't want their parents posting about them on social media, um, meaning like don't post pictures of me on Facebook, mom, uh, and that was actually coming up a bit, and, and uh, the media covered that and, and thought that was an interesting finding, even though it was kind of actually a minor part of our study. Um, but you know, what we did was we actually surveyed um, 249 parent-child dyads. So the parent took a survey, then they got their child to come and take the survey, um, and they had similar sets of questions um, about themselves. And then um, the other thing we did was ask about um, how hard or easy it was to follow as well. Um, so you know, and so we learned about which which rules that parents made that were easy to follow versus those that were hard to follow. Um, and you know, things that we learned was obviously technology distracts from being present. And that was the number one request of the kids, of their parents, was to be present with me. Don't look at your phone the whole time. I want you to look at me when I'm talking to you. And that came out quite a bit, especially with our younger uh, families. Yep. Do you find also the opposite? Kind of like, well, their kids off their phone. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, there's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely parents like, oh, my kid's like, you know, on the phone, especially the teenagers. Um, like, they're on social media all the time. I can't get them off. So that came up a lot. Um, there's issues around uh, privacy when things got older. So parents said like their rule was that their, their kids had to give them uh, their login and password for every account that they created. Uh, of course, like a 13-year-old who's just getting started is like, OK, mom, that's fine. But as the kid got older, uh, yeah, that wasn't quite as much of an issue. That was much more of an issue as the kid got older. So there's sort of these changing needs as the, the kids get older. Um, and then you know, this, all this management also took time away from you know, setting these rules that took time away from family time as well. So even just managing uh, technology in general was, was taking away from families. Um, this is kind of not related to user burden, but one of our big findings was things like um, that we were surprised about was that um, context-based rules were much harder to follow than um, just straight out banning rules. So things like, what I mean by context rules was that um, no phones at the dinner table was hard, uh, as opposed to kind of an activity-based rule like no Instagram. Like it was actually easier for kids to say, I'm okay, and it's easy to follow the no Instagram rule than it is no phones at the, um, the dinner table. So these rules that are around like not using the phone in certain contexts, like at church or while driving or in certain locations are much harder to follow than the rules that were just don't post about you know, sexual stuff or you know, don't talk to strangers online. Those were actually easier to follow than the ones that were, were kind of these more contextual rules. But there's a stronger desire for these context rules because they're more meaningful. right? I don't care what you're doing on your phone as long as you, you're not disrupting family time. So there was sort of this desire to have more rules around context, but they're actually harder to follow and enforce. Um, so we think there's an opportunity to, for, in, in design for that. Um, so that was sort of these larger sort of formative studies that we had done that informed a lot of our thinking around user burden um, and led to sort of our, our initial set of the, 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 we started out with in our, our scale 120 questions um, and then those end up being narrowed down to 20. So um, and that's how we did our, our um, development of the constructs. But um, now that we have a good understanding of user burden, we want to know how can we reduce it as well. Um, so what can we do? Um, through design or um, through other sorts of things to, to help reduce each of these burdens. Um, so we've designed a number of different tools that try to address different burdens. Um, and you know, through all of this is what we realize is that, and I think I kind of alluded to this earlier, it's impossible to probably minimize every single burden at once. You know, there's always going to be some trade-off. Um, so, for example, you might want to minimize privacy burdens because people very much care about their privacy, but then by lowering the privacy burden, you're raising the mental effort associated with sort of managing that privacy. So, you know, I think privacy is pretty important for people on Facebook, and that's probably why they ended up with this pretty complex set of privacy rules, because it's impossible to sort of minimize privacy while also minimizing mental effort and, and understanding at the same time. So, um, so in each of these, we, I talk about kind of the burdens that we try to prioritize in each of our designs and how we try to address that particular burden. But in doing that, sometimes we raise the burden in other ways. Did you have a question, Michael? The comments you made me yeah. wonder out loud, um, how much do people feel like these burdens are extrinsic to them versus something that they can actually manage? So it's like, oh, I hate you know, managing privacy, but I know I can fix it. You know, right. but, or is it like, Facebook is like right. doing this to me, and it's yeah. like, 
Like, yeah. Did you do anything about it? There was some of that. So, and, and some of it was interesting too that it had come up in our interviews after we were interviewing people about different burdens is that people were sometimes having trouble differentiating sort of the content from the actual design of the tool. Um, so for some people said like, oh, there's a huge emotional burden with Facebook when people post like depressing, sad things. And that's not necessarily Facebook's fault. <laughs> um, it's your friend's fault, right? Um, so people had sort of trouble separating themselves from that. And um, I know that's kind of tangential to what you're saying, but I think also your questions are about, do they feel like they had control over the burden that was? Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. It suggests that they wouldn't feel that right. It's like it's the thing does it to me. Right. It's like as opposed to I'm doing this to myself. Right. Although I would imagine the thing like time, like yeah. on Kindle, you, you have more awareness that you control over it. Right. Right. So yeah, I think there was definitely some of this. Like people who were concerned about things like addiction sort of felt like it was it should be within my control, but I can't help it sort of thing. So right. there was sort of that. That was probably the biggest thing that came up was this worried about I use it too much, Netflix and Reddit and stuff like that came up a lot for for. It would be interesting to see, like, you know, that diamond, mm -hmm. you know, just a percentage, like, my fault versus their fault. Right. Like, presumably something like financial burden. Yeah. It's all going to be all the way up. Exactly. Fault, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, we hadn't looked at that angle, but I think that's, that's an interesting part to look at. Yeah. I'm supposed to bury the, the parent children. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so, do you, I'm not sure if you know this, but the contrast between um, parent children. <laughs> Parents and children were related. So let's say we, the, the parent wanted the, the child to come off their phone and look, you know, look at them, in, um, look them in the eye while talking to them, or the or vice versa. Do you find that usually it was one of the two in any pair that wanted that, or like both? Because it would be interesting right. if more usually it was one person in that pair who wanted the other to do that. And not the other. You know, I'm not sure we did that specific type of analysis. I suspect there might be some of that, right? So, like, um, you know, there's always one person in the diet who's sort of more aware than the other of that this is an issue. Um, so, like, the oblivious parent is sitting there texting while the ch child's sitting there, like, I want you to watch my soccer game, right? Um, or, yeah, versus, like, the the child who's, like, I, it's, it's hard to say. I'm not sure. I, we, we'd have to look into the data a little bit more, but I suspect there could be definitely unequal amounts of that. And some of it had to do with also probably just values as a family. Um, some people, we were hearing a lot of things about rules, like, um, you know, no, no screens between, like, 5 and 7 o'clock at night. Um, and so that was sort of the family had set that as a rule, and so then people were more on the same page. Um, than people who sort of like the parent was like, I'm just going to set these rules and everyone's going to follow them no matter what. Um, so the, it seemed, that was another finding was that the, the, the rules that were sort of set together with input from the children and everyone in it were much more likely to be followed than the ones that were sort of set, you know, kind of authoritatively or authoritarianly uh, by the, the parent without input from the, the child. So yeah, I suspect there was some of that going on. Great. Um, so I'm going to go through these fairly quickly because do I have till... 1.30, okay, so I have some a little bit more time then. Um, so I mentioned I did a bunch of stuff in the sleep space, and that actually was a really interesting area to explore different types of burdens, because there's a bunch of stuff relating to sleep with that. But you know, when we first started this work, we actually wanted to start out with, um, and this is sort of a reaction to the, the survey we did with um, the participants who just said, like, I don't want to think about this. You know, Don't make me do anything while I'm groggy and sleepy. Um, tracking is really burdensome, all these sorts of things, but I want to know how to make myself healthier. So there's sort of this, they didn't want to do anything, but they wanted to have a benefit, which, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could do that? So we thought, well, could we actually design something that didn't require any sort of input or, or effort at all? Um, so our first experiment with that was looking at, um, looking at just a passive uh, wallpaper, active wallpaper that would update throughout the day and inform people of when the uh, different types of activities might have an impact on their sleep or not. Um, so the idea is that things like if you drink caffeine after a certain time of day, it can impact your sleep negatively. If you exercise within so many hours of going to bed, it can impact your um, lives, um, you know, it can impact your sleep. Uh, if you drink alcohol before a certain amount of time, then um, that can also impact your sleep. Um, but then if you also start to relax before going to bed, that can help your sleep. But you know, it's hard to keep track of all these things. Um, so the idea is that you know, all they would do when they download the app was set up their wake up, their ideal wake up time and their ideal sleep time. That was the only entering they had to do and they just let it go. Um, throughout the day it would actually update. So the idea is that this white vertical line is um, uh, uh, the current time. And then if the line is thin, that means if you did that right now, activity right now would have a negative impact on your sleep. Uh, if the line is thick, if you did the activity now, it probably wouldn't have a negative impact on the sleep. So the idea is you can kind of get a sense of the circadian rhythm going on um, and throughout the day. So I could quickly glance and say, okay, it's 6.30, it's too late for coffee, uh, it's too late for napping. Uh, napping is actually really only good at that time after lunch. 
Um, it's still okay to exercise, still okay to eat, alcohol, woohoo, uh, but not quite time to start relaxing yet. So they've got to get a quick sense of that as they're doing their other things throughout the day. So no tracking, um, no thinking about it. It was just sort of an ambient display of, of what that. And we did actually find after four weeks of use that um, uh, at least eight of our 12 participants um, were able to increase their, their sleepiness level, or sorry, their, decrease their overall daytime sleepiness levels just by having this app alone. Um, so even without any effort whatsoever, we were able to find some improvement um, overall without any burden whatsoever in terms of that. Um, so we kind of said this was targeting, you know, we didn't want to have people wear anything or have to remember to track anything. So this is kind of looking at the, the mental burdens and the physical burdens, trying to reduce those in particular. Um, so another example of this was that then, <laughs> then we ran the study and, you know, People never know what they want, but they, the people in that study said like, oh, I want, it would be great if I could actually track my caffeine use. And they're like, okay, you told us before that you didn't want to track anything, and then after you used this for a month, you said you do want to track these things. Um, so we thought, okay, well, what would tracking add to this if we were going to add um, something? So again, we're trying to focus in on, you know, people don't want to go through and enter in all these complicated things. They don't have to think very much. Um, so again, we're sort of utilizing the, the lock screen here and wanted to do these one-tap manual entries. Because um, a lot of the things related to sleep are actually hard to sense automatically um, or are pretty onerous to sense in general or privacy concerning. You know, if you log everything, then it might increase the privacy burden. So the idea was to make a super simple, super easy um, tracking tool for capturing moments of your day throughout that have an impact on your sleep. Um, so we used the, the Android's lock screen widgets and made just a, a button. So you just have to turn on your phone and you can tap, um, I had a caffeinated beverage, I exercised. I had a cigarette and I had medication, and it'll create this log of you and, and kind of give you this visualization. Um, and then you can kind of come up with these. And we did have them fill out a sleep diary in the beginning, but you could also use a, a, a just a, a sleep sensing tool as well. But for our study, we had them manually log those things in the beginning of the day. Um, and then you can kind of get to see um, uh, over time um, which of the factors you're doing would um, have an impact on their uh, overall sleep quality. So you can kind of get a sense of, oh yeah, if I had caffeine after six o'clock, it looks like I got worse sleep that night. So you can kind of start to make those connections together. We still don't think this is the best way to do it, and I'll allude to that in a minute. Um, but you know, the idea was just to make it super dead simple, no time, you know, reducing the time burden, reducing the mental effort associated with that. Um, we also found that just by having it on the lock screen, it was a great reminder to just log it quickly. Um, so it was also reducing sort of the, the having to remember, oh, I got to go in and do that because they'd look at their phone and say, oh, yep, I had a, I'm drinking coffee right now, do it right there. So did a good job of minimizing uh, those particular burdens. Um, also in the sleep space, uh, we wanted to look at things like um, looking at the environmental and how environment and how that can have an impact on sleep. So things like the light levels, the temperature levels, the sound levels in the room can all have an impact on sleep. Um, again, people wanted to try and figure out what their disruptors were since they're different for different people. Um, so we developed a, a tool that just uh, had a set of sensors that was in the bedroom and gave people just a really quick um, feedback that um, the ideal conditions in the room were either present or not present for those things. And so um, you know, the sleep literature recommends keeping your bedroom between like, you know, I think 58 degrees and 70 degrees. So we gave them just a, a green light or red light if they're within the recommended range, um, as well as um, light levels and um, noise levels. And we had motion sensors for tech detecting things like you know, pets in the room or children coming in and those sorts of things. So, um, but. This is sort of to give people a broad understanding of it. And then um, we were able to generate graphs of, of the different um, uh, um, patterns on their sleep levels in combination with those environmental sensors. Um, but this is actually, we, and we recorded videos so they could go under there. So the videos of the bedroom were actually pretty privacy invasive, but they were necessary for people to sort of investigate what was going on. Um, so we had to really think about like, how to control the privacy there. Um, so we had really quick one touch, turn on and off the camera or just the recording. Um, as well as, you know, from our studies, you know, things happen in the bedroom that you don't want recorded, uh, especially if you have a partner. Uh, and so we had a really quickly delete last hour, um, as well as a uh, delete more. Um, we had to be able to do this in such a way that we could kind of delete the things that they didn't want to see, um, but still make it useful. So if they want to go in and do this analysis of, you know, the light levels, um, uh, were they actually, you know, impacting my sleep or not. So they still need to be useful to them without while well, trying to minimize the privacy burden. Um, so that was the thing. Again, we learned that just capturing things isn't enough, so I'm going to talk about what we're going to do next in that regard. Um, 
This one was uh, more about, um, uh, we did a project looking at how um, the visually impaired might be able to be helped with exercise. Um, the idea that many exercise classes and extra games are not accessible because they require you to line up your body with the screen. And if you can't see the screen, then obviously you can't do that. Um, so my student, Kyle Rector, did a project looking at you how you make a yoga-based game that you only uses the visual channel to um, help people with things like correcting yoga postures and, and being able to perform exercise. Um, so that was sort of minimizing the difficulty or accessibility issues. Um, and then the idea that most of the time, if they want to do an exercise class, like go to a yoga class, many people, especially if they live uh, remotely, have to travel large uh, distances to get to those special classes that are accessible. Um, so that was sort of reducing the time burden there. Um, I'm going to quickly go through this since I'm running a little bit on time. But um, the other thing we wanted to look at, this is in the family context as well, but a lot of, because parents were concerned about the amount of time that their, their families were using on technology, we developed a tool called My Time. This is also going to be presented at CHI next month. Um, but looking at letting people determine which of their apps on their phone are time-wasting or disruptive to the family and monitoring those um, use over time. So you know, the idea is they could declare Candy Crush and um, Facebook and Twitter and all these tools as being kind of time-wasting or disruptive to their um, families. Um, and it would track those and give them a goal. So my goal is to spend only 20 minutes per day on these things. Um, and they were also to encourage them to do other things. They were at the beginning of the day. They were encouraged to enter a goal um, for the day that they would like to do instead of doing these things. So they did like you know go for a walk outside or talk with my family. You know, a lot of times like spend time with my family was the biggest thing there. Um, so we did a multiple baseline study where they had the intervention for uh, or they didn't have the intervention for um, about a week and we randomized that and then they switched over to using it and we actually saw just a 21. Uh, percent decrease in the amount of time. Just with this simple intervention, we were able to show um, a 21 percent decrease in the amount of time on time-wasting apps just with this simple intervention there. Um, lastly, um, I talked about the sleep stuff and how it was not so useful to just collect a bunch of data. Uh, and actually doing it in a more systematic way will help people find the answers to the questions that they want to be able to answer. Um, so we thought about how we can help people run little mini self-experiments to answer those questions. So most of what people wanted to get out, and this came up a lot from the quantified self stuff, people were tracking these things because they had a specific question. What's causing my headaches? You know, why do I have abdominal pain? Uh, you know, what's disrupting my sleep at night? And you know, a lot of the tools will allow you to sort of collect all this data and you have to sort of make that conclusion on your own. Um, but they're actually not really able to, to make that connection for you. Um, but what you really need to do is actually do some days you control something and some days you take that out um, and you look at what happens on those days. Um, so we're developing a tool right now to allow people to do these self-experiments, um, starting with irritable bowel syndrome, but also looking at things like um, uh, insomnia and smoking cravings, um, but looking at how we can uh, allow people to test things like lactose. Is lactose what's causing my upset stomach? Uh, we will randomize them to um, an 8 to 12 day randomized trial and we tell them to basically you know, eat your normal breakfast but remove, you know, replace it with lactose free milk on these days. So it'll randomize them to which days they drink the lactose free milk and then on the other days they have it and then we have them log their symptoms. Um, and so we have some visualizations to help them look at, you know, these are the days that you know, if they're testing caffeine, these are the days that I had caffeine and what my, my symptoms were like, and these are the days of no caffeine. And, you know, we're, we're working on, we're still, this is still a work in progress, but we're also experimenting things like, you know, significance and p-values and that sort of thing, but it turns out most people don't really get that. So just looking at it visually was actually much more helpful for people and giving a recommendation that it's highly likely that your symptoms are caused by um, caffeine or not caused by caffeine and giving them feedback there. Um, um, lastly, you know, I mentioned the, um, the, the, in the very beginning, a lot of this work was, was motivated by you know, parents having this emotional burden associated with things like tracking development in their young kids. Um, so this is a project that we were looking at for helping parents from, of children ages 0 to 5 track developmental progress um, and identify early if they have signs of developmental delay, like things like speech delays or um, anxiety disorders or things along those lines. Um, and you know, we wanted to do this in a way that was motivating to people to be able to do this, um, would reduce the emotional burden associated with this, this idea that something could be wrong with your kid, um, and um, also do it in a way that was accessible. So we were working with the state of Washington, and they had the goal of screening every single child in the state, regardless of access to technology or income levels, 
um, in there. So we had two kind of goals with this one, which was reducing the financial burden of people who couldn't necessarily afford smartphones and things along those lines, as well as reducing the um, emotional burdens and the mental burdens associated with this activity. Um, so our solution, what we ended up doing here, was actually not one tool, but it ended up being an ecosystem of tools that all would meet people to where they were um, and allow them to use whatever technologies were most um, useful to them. So we have um, a website that also is accessible via a mobile phone. Um, we have a Twitter-based tool where they can actually answer developmental questions through Twitter, um, as well as a text messaging only um, version that they can answer developmental screen questions just through text message. So the idea being, if they didn't have internet at home, they could use just a text messaging tool. Um, to reduce financial burdens of people who didn't have access to that technology. Um, and then also, for the emotional burden, you know, we did a lot of work on trying to come up with a visualization that would show the kids' developmental progress. And we looked at, we showed them things like graphs and percentile charts, and those all performed very poorly in terms of like making people anxious about their kids. So instead, we used sort of this metaphor of their child growing, and if they're lower in a particular developmental category, it's just that their tree, you know, their, their, their child just hadn't grown up yet, um, so they weren't necessarily behind. But it was enough to convey the information and, and encourage people to take action on it, but not yet um, show them on a percentile chart that their kid is, you know, two second percentile. So that was really um, nerve-wracking to a lot of people. Um, I know I went through those really quickly, but do you guys have any questions on any of those? Yeah. Have you run into any problems with, like, the FDA trying to step in and say, oh, you're giving people medical advice about, like, whether they're lactose intolerant? Or yeah, so, um, yeah, so the FDA has pretty strict guidelines, and if it's a diagnosis or treatment of a condition, then yeah. Um, but if it's sort of lifestyle decisions, then that sort of is in this gray area that's not necessarily under their purview. Um, so from their perspective, controlling your diet and stuff isn't necessarily a known way of treating irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, so it's not seen as being treated as sort of a kind of lifestyle choice, and so it sort of falls into that area. But um, we, we did write an article on sort of this you know, self-experimentation in general. And you, you could self-experiment with your um, anxiety meds. You could self-experiment with uh, other things. And we specifically call out in that paper that, you know, please don't self-experiment on things without, with things like medication without a doctor's guidance. Because um, people could use that tool to do those things. And that would be concerning if they were doing that on their own. But yeah, it does depend on the domain and kind of what you're trying. Um, but if you were sort of testing whether or not a medication was helpful for irritable bowel syndrome, it might start to fall under that. Um, but we're in a pretty open platform right now, so people can kind of self-define what they want and try their own things. But we do recommend not to do those particular things. Yeah. Can you define the relationship between any cause and effect using the app? What I mean is, um, just set a cause, mm -hmm. set an effect, then collect data on both, and then is that how it works? No, so I mean, we're actually randomizing people today. So the, the problem with sort of like looking at just collecting data and setting those variables after the fact is that you know, it could be any number of things that impacted that. So if you just say like, okay, show me all the days that I drank caffeine and what my sleep level was like that day. Well, it could be that you drank more caffeine because you were tired and therefore it was infecting your thing. So we wanted to try to minimize that altogether, which is why we do this random assignment. So yeah, this is more before the fact and what you're gonna track. So you would send today, don't drink any caffeine after three o'clock. Um, um, tomorrow, drink caffeine at 6 o'clock, and you know, the, we alternate on those days. And that will minimize a lot of those other things, as opposed to like, oh, I had a stressful work day, so I had um, caffeine that day. Which, but it turns out the stress was the cause of your sleep and not the actual caffeine. It was, so that's sort of trying to isolate the, the particular ones, which is why you know, doing these sort of after-the-fact correlations is problematic. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the, yeah, and you, you hit it on one of the, the important things. So, you know, obviously, they do double-blind studies um, in, you know, med medicine for a reason. Um, and you know, we thought about things like, you know, if it was like a lactose-free milk, you know, like your, your partner could sneak you on some days, you know, like they could sneak in the lactose-free milk and you wouldn't know it. Um, but that is something that we wouldn't necessarily have to control. But you know, one of the things that's okay for this is that you know, what we want to do is a perceived reduction of symptoms. And you know, most of the people who are doing this um, wanted their, the, the impact that they were having on them. And so our scales are actually pretty well designed in terms of like it was more impact on their day um, as opposed to like this kind of subjective feeling. So and that's a little bit. So we try to keep with more objective measures for that because there's a possibility of, of placebo effect in, in some of these cases. So as much as we can do to sort of look at the objectiveness of it as opposed to the subjective rating. Um, and you know, in some cases, placebo is okay too. Um, yeah, placebo works <laughs> in some cases. So if that if that works in minimizing their symptoms, maybe it's okay too. Yeah. 
Twitter. Natural, natural language input in the Twitter based UI to baby steps or similar yes no pipe? What is that? Sorry. The Twitter based UI to the baby steps? Oh yeah. What so kind of input came back from the from the parents? Um, so the parents were oh, so it was um, it was automatically uh, tweeted through our, our tool there, um, and parents would just say yes sometimes or not yet. It wasn't sort of doing the smart analysis of things. There are people who are looking at some of that stuff. We weren't. We were just looking at parents explicitly answering the question. Uh, yeah. The questions get asked. Is this like a one-time thing, or like maybe you're reminded to right. like answer it every two yeah, months? Yeah, good question. So it's actually um, a set of 22 questionnaires over a five-year period. Um, so we're looking at, and there's 30 questions per questionnaire. Um, so we're looking at you know, over um, over 300 question, even more than that, uh, over the lifetime of a child, and that's per kid too. So you have multiple kids, you have to answer them for each child. So that was why we wanted to sort of meet them throughout there. Um, it depends on the age of the child, actually. So there's a lot more questions when the kid is younger, but then when they get older, it's like one questionnaire every six months, as opposed to when they're younger, it's like one questionnaire every month. So it depended on on that. Um, but for Twitter, we were tweeting out one question a day. Um, and then for the text messaging, we actually did it differently. Um, basically, if you answer a question, it sends you another one immediately. Um, so the idea is you could actually answer them all in one sitting. And the reason for that was because in talking with advocates for Latino families, they said a lot of times they would get prepaid phones and turn them off. Um, so you couldn't necessarily space it out so it was like one question per day because they may not have their phone on after they turn it off because they had a prepaid plan and they ran out of minutes. Um, so then we were able to kind of answer them all in one, one setting there. Great. Um, so just in conclusion, um, we have some just general strategies that we've sort of tried to bubble up as, as uh, ways of reducing user burden in general. Um, first is that you know, embedding actions into activities that people are already doing is a really successful way of doing that. So this was apparent in our, our baby steps tool where people are already on Twitter and they were already doing other things. So we can also just ask them questions while they're doing those things. So if, if somebody's already doing something, that's a great way to sort of also add on something um, that they're, they're doing. Um, providing multiple options for achieving goals. So, you know, obviously if some people find some type of technology more burdensome than another, you know, giving them multiple options will help reduce burden in general because then they can choose the tool that they're, they're uh, most comfortable with. Um, try to, f and this is sort of a, a, a kind of um, platitude of, of human computer interaction in general, but know your users, know what's most burdens are most important to them. Uh, knowing your users will really help you sort of prioritize which ones because again, you can't reduce them all at once. Um, and yeah, figure out what those trade-offs are. If you raise one, lower one burden, will you raise another? So figure out what those trade-offs are going to be. Um, and then this is sort of getting a little bit of that value question. So um, we found that people are really motivated, who are really motivated, like quantified selfers, were willing to put up with like large amounts of burden because they were highly motivated. Where someone who's just kind of curious, oh, you know, I want to see what my levels are like, you know, they were much less likely to put up with, with you know, large amounts of user burden. So try to figure out the motivation level of your user and try to match the burden with that particular um, uh, uh, motivation level. Um, and then finally, through all of this, you know, we realized that like data is actually pretty burdensome in general. Uh, it's like kind of, you know, we're in this big data, let's collect all the data that we can. Um, but the more data you have, the more time it takes to do, the more privacy burdens it reduces, it, it comes up, the more th you have to think about it. Um, so that was what we were thinking a lot with our self-experimentation stuff is like, what's the minimum amount of things that we actually have to answer to be able to um, uh, come up with the conclusions that we had. So with our self-experimentation, all they have to do is stick to the plan and record their symptoms. That's it. They don't have to record what they ate. They just have to stick to the plan. So they don't have to record anything. So we tried to narrow it down to the minimum amount of data needed to actually answer the question that they wanted to do. So that was uh, another key insight. Um, next steps. So we want to try to ref keep refining this model as well as the, um, the validated measure. You guys actually gave me a lot of good ideas um, for how to, uh, to work on that. Um, and um, one of the other things is that our scale right now only works for people who have already used the technology. Um, we'd love to be able to know early on in the early stage prototyping if we can sort of predict it or know earlier on while we're designing it that this is going to have a burden. So we're trying to think of ideas of how we can try and learn that earlier on without having to have them actually use the technology in the first place. Um, so I have many amazing students. I try to put their names up wherever possible um, and lots of Cool people gave me money, so thanks to them. <laughs> and thanks to you guys. <laughs> Thank you.